All right, hey, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to sit up in your seats. I need you to take your phone and put it away where for the next few moments, if you could just put it away for me. Um, and I ask that you give me the same respect that I give you to, uh, you know, because I put in time, I put in preparation to, to share and hang out with you guys. And I just ask that you give me the same respect that I give you just for the next few moments. And, uh, and we're going to kick off this year um, in prayer and then we're gonna jump into this message. So let's pray. God, thank you for bringing us here. Thank you for allowing each and every student to be here tonight. And I thank you that they're here, not by mistake, but by design, that you have destined for them to be here. And so God, I pray that as we enter into this new year, that it will be a good year, a fresh year, a year like we never thought we would have because we are gonna fall so in love with you that it is gonna change everything that we thought we knew about where we were with you. God, I pray that as we examine our hearts and as we even change the hearts and the way that we think and the way we feel and the way that we love, God, that you would just do a transformation in our lives. In Jesus' name, and everybody says, amen. Amen. Well, guys, we're gonna kick off this series to, that is called Change Your Heart. Change Your Heart. I want everyone to put their hand on their heart right now. Put your hand on your heart right now. If one thing all of us have in common, we have a heart that is beating right now. Uh, we have a heart that is, that is alive and well, and we're going to be talking about your heart. As you feel your heart, as your hands on your heart, think about this. We put a lot of emphasis on protecting our bodies, right, guarding our bodies. I mean, when you go to play soccer, you buy shin guards to protect your shins. When you play hockey, you buy pads to protect yourselves. When you play football, you put a helmet on your head to play. Now, back in the day, they didn't used to wear helmets. They used to run around. Even in hockey, they didn't wear helmets. If you look at all the old hockey players, they all have no teeth. Like, they're like, they talk like this when they're talking. They don't have any teeth. And all the football players, they, ha they, they just, they had concussions and brain damage and all these things. We keep our bodies safe and healthy. We literally spend thousands and thousands of dollars on safety on guarding, on making sure that something doesn't happen to our bodies. Even, even once we get hurt, we put a cast on or we put a brace on to make sure that we protect whatever it is that is hurt and that is going on. And, and I was thinking about this, how we guard a lot of things in our life, but do we really know how to guard our heart? Other than putting on a full suit of armor and running around like a medieval knight going everywhere, that'd be kind of crazy, uh, doing that. You just pointed at him like, yes, he does this all the time. Like Sir Isaiah runs around in school. Um, so other than like putting on a suit of armor and protecting your heart, how do we really protect our heart? In the next few weeks, that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the change of the heart, protecting your heart, elevating your heart. What do all these things mean? And this is what I found. Everybody make a fist. The average heart is the size of your fist, but then get, get this, it weighs as light as a can of pop or a can of soda. So it's as light as an empty uh, can of soda or pop. That's what your heart weighs that much, but your heart is about as big as your fist. Your heart will beat about 115,000 times each day. And more so when you're stressed out or when you're taking a test or when you see that special someone. Yeah, you know who you're talking about when you see your mom. Um, your heart, your heart pumps 2,000 gallons. Listen, your heart pumps 2,000 gallons of blood every day. Another cool thing is laughter is actually good for your heart. It balances your hormones, increases good HDL uh, in your body, and so it allows and promotes healthiness when you laugh. It's good for your heart. And the heart can even continue beating after you're dead. That'd be kind of creepy, right? Like you die and then your chest is still, go, bum, 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 bum. that'd be just, that'd be kind of weird. It's like when you cut a chicken's head off and the chicken still runs around for a little bit with its head cut off. Okay, you guys look like, all right, you know what I'm talking about. But think about this. We oftentimes forget about how much our heart does because our heart is so important to us as humans. It's, it's part of our anatomy, of our makeup, and it's such an important thing. And if something happens to our heart, instantly we can die. It's one of those things that instantly, if something goes wrong with your heart, uh, your physical heart, it can die. And so I was thinking about this, and I was thinking about how important our heart is physically, but how important our heart is also spiritually. 
We know that living for God is, is really a matter of the heart. Like it's a really a matter of what you believe deep within your heart and who you are and how you live. And so sometimes we often say that we make all of these decisions with our mind and with our brain, which we, we do, but a lot of times we make major decisions based upon what we feel in our heart what we feel deep inside of, of, of who we are. And, and I was thinking about how does this matter to us, the matters of the heart? What is the condition of what our heart looks like right now? If you remember last school year, I asked you, how is your heart doing? Is your heart doing okay? How is your heart throughout the summer? How is your heart since we last met? Is your heart doing okay? Or do you need a change of heart? And that's what we're gonna talk about a little bit tonight. In fact, God actually has a lot to say about the condition of our heart. The book of Proverbs found in the Bible talks about your heart a lot, and that's where we're going to spend a majority of our time. Check this, what it says in Proverbs 4, 20 through 23. It says, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ears to my words. Do not let them go out of your sight. Keep them within your hearts. It says, keep them within your heart. For, for they are life to those who find them and health to one's whole body. Above all else... Guard your heart, for everything that you do flows from it. So we, we see here in verse 20, it's on the screen, it says, you know, keep them within your heart, guard your heart. So the, the Bible is telling us, listen, there's something that is so important that is inside of you that, that you need to listen for the words that are out there, the words that are said, and then you need to keep them, and then you need to guard them in your heart. It's like when you get your favorite snack, whatever it might be, donuts, goldfish, Cheez-Its, Flaming Hot Cheetos, Snickers. I don't know, some of you maybe celery or carrots, I don't know. Whatever your favorite snack is, you have that favorite snack, right? And, and you have it and it's given to you. And, and then of course, when your friends see that you have a snack, what happens? Can I have a bite? Can I get a bite? Or you have a drink. And it's hot outside, and it's your drink. You bought it with your own money. And I was, can I get a sip? Can I get a sip? No, you may not get it. And what do they do? They sip it anyways. But you protect that with everything because you don't want to give that up. Why? Because it's important to you. What this scripture is saying is when you have it, when you have it, that you need to protect it at all costs. And when we read this, we got to understand that there has got to be something that we're protecting our heart from. Because if there's something out there that we need to protect from, we really need to pay attention to what it is that our heart needs to be guarded from. When I read this verse, I get two things, guys. Keep it in your heart, guard it in your heart. When I read that, that's what it's saying. It's saying keep it in your heart, guard it in your heart. But the big question is, what is this it that we're talking about? If we're talking about keeping it in your heart and guarding it in your heart, what is the it? The it can, this is, this is a pretty loaded question. What is the it that we're going to be talking about? Well, the it is whatever you decide to fill your life with. So whatever that it is that you're putting in your heart, whether it's the good things, the right things, the, the things that we know about, the love, the peace, the joy, the patience, the kindness, all that good stuff that we can put in our heart, or it can be all of the not so good stuff that we put in our heart. The trash, the filth, the hatred, the anger, the bitterness, all of those things that we put within who we are. But something is going into your heart, but what is it that is going in? What are you putting into your heart? What is it that you're, that you're feasting upon and you're, and you're constantly thinking about and you're constantly living out that is deep within your heart? Is it always anger? Is it just being mad all the time at everything, about the situations in life, about where you're at, about things not going the way that you wanted to? And is it this angerness that just sits in your heart and what you fill it with is more anger? You listen to music that makes you angry. You do things that make you angry. You do all these things to fill it. Or is it going after God with everything that you have and having this level of peace and just being around things that make you calm and things that going to church and reading the word and, uh, of God and being able to pray and do all these things? What is it, the it that is in your heart? It's important to remember this, that we gotta keep it in our heart. The right it has to be in our heart. It's important to think about when we interact with people, we gain knowledge on a daily basis. And we live in such a crazy, crazy time where back in the day, if you wanted to know what something meant, you had to go look in a thing called a dictionary and you had to open the page in alphabetical order, find the word, find out what it means. Right now you can just go and say, hey Siri, tell me what this means. 
and you can have information at your fingertips. The source of getting knowledge, the source of knowing things, you can know it just like that. You could have the most complicated math problem to know. You could type it in on the internet and boom, it will tell you exactly the answer, exactly how to get the answer and the steps to take on how to get that. We live in a society where information for anything that we need is right there. Just, just think about all the information that floods your mind just within being in one day. Just in school, all the information that's dumped on you. When you watch something, all the information that's dumped on you. When you're participating in whatever it is, all the information. You ever have a thing called information overload? You know, like when they're giving you so much, you're like, my brain's dead. Like you just killed my brain. Like you put way too much in your brain. Or you're like, you have that poof. You know what I'm talking about? Like when someone drops something on you, when someone drops knowledge on you, and you're like, thank you for making my brain explode. I appreciate it. Like that was so good, it was like poof. And we live in a world where there's so many resources of what we see, but we have to understand that everything we see, we hear, and we participate in affects our heart. Understand that. That everything that we're doing, the things that we're talking about, the things that we're watching, the things that we're listening to, the things that we're participating in, it all kind of filters into us and affects our hearts. So if you're around a certain group of people doing a certain thing, it's going to affect who you are and it's going to affect what is going on in your heart. So have this understanding that there's an it that is in your heart, but is it the right thing that is going there. Everything we see and we hear is filtered through it. The Bible says this. It's actually kind of crazy because we have this heart. We're talking about the goodness of the heart. But the Bible says in Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Well, that gives us a lot of hope. Basically saying that your heart is full of hatred and it can't be cured. Well, thanks. So what do I do? Do I just say, oh, you know, forget life. And just I'm going to allow my heart to be filled with all these bad things all the time. I'm going to be hateful. I'm going to be deceitful. And, and nothing is ever going to change. No, that isn't what it is saying. This isn't what Jeremiah is saying. He's saying, listen, the heart is deceitful. We are born into a life of sin. We are born into these issues, these problems. And, and you've got to understand that there, are, there is going to be a nature of us that wants to do wrong. The nature is the one to do wrong. If someone comes up and smacks me in the face, guess what I want to do? Smack them back in the face. If someone comes up and, you know, does something to hurt me, I want to hurt them back. If, just instantly when someone says don't do something, what do you want to do? You want to do the very thing they told you not to do. See, there's this part of us as humans that we are deceitful and that we want to do the wrong things. And, and part of our heart is that the heart is not good. And if your heart isn't good, your life probably isn't good either. Understand what I just said. I want everybody to look at me. Understand what I just said. If your heart isn't good right now, probably the condition of your life isn't very good either. Because what you live out in your life is a real reflection of the condition of your heart. Of how your heart is. And what's going on deep within your heart. So have that understanding and, and think, well, think about it this way. Let's go back to food because we love talking about food. Think about your stomach. So think about this. You go home and you're hungry. You're like, you want some food right now. You're like, mm, I'm hungry. I could use some food right now. I'd like something to eat. But then like a little bit more time goes on and you don't get the food. And then you, you start to get really hungry. Like really hungry. And you're like, all right, well, I'm really hungry right now, but I don't have access to anything and I can't get anything because nobody has anything because my friends ate all my food because they're jerks and I don't know what to do and I'm hungry. But then you move past hunger. You ain't hungry no more. You hangry. You hang, you know what I'm talking about. You hangry. You're like, listen, if someone does, if you don't go get me food, I'm going to eat you. You better get me something right now. Like give me some food. And you're hangry and you're at that point. So what do we naturally do? It's kind of like what happens to me some nights after refuge. Some nights when it's late, I'm hungry. It's so easy for me to just drive through like McDonald's or Wendy's or Taco Bell or Arby's or Chick-fil-A because we love the chick. It's so easy for me to go and eat like junk food. Oh yeah, bag of chips. Yeah, I'm just going to hell. And let's be honest, you don't really eat just like one or two chips. You eat in the whole bag. It's like, oh, yeah, you know, they have that, they have an advisory on like, this is for like 20, like eat 28 chips. 28 chips. Is, like 28 single chips is a serving. No, the whole bag is a serving, okay? But think about it. When we're hungry, we immediately, our stomach is, we want something and we'll just eat anything and it's not good for us. We will eat food that is not good for us. 
Why? Because the hunger is rising up and it's saying, give me something to fill my stomach. You're out there, your stomach's growling like King Kong and you're hungry and you're like, give me whatever. So you'll eat whatever you can to fill that and the hunger will subside. But about an hour, 45 minutes to an hour, you feel rumbly in your tumbly. And you're like, something doesn't feel so good right now. And the older you get, the worse it gets. I'm just telling you right now. And you're like, I'm going to be sick. And you got to like run to the bathroom or you got to run outside or you got to, you know, you, whatever it might be. And it, it affected you because you were so hungry that you just ate junk and you thought it would satisfy, but then it didn't. It's the same way that your heart is. That your heart is, is hungry for something. Your heart wanting to do right. But the more you fill it with junk and the wrong things, then, then that's what's going to come out of you. It's going to be something that's not good. It's going to be something that is not pleasant. It's going to be something that makes other people sick. Why? Because what you're filling with it, your heart hungers for something, and you're just putting junk in your heart. You're just filling it with the garbage and all of these things. And when he's saying is the heart is deceitful above all things beyond cure, he's talking at this point there is nothing that can cure it but... Jesus. But Jesus, having a relationship with Jesus, it can cure your heart. It can make it absolutely new. We must keep what's good in our hearts so that it comes out of our lives. Understand that. We must keep what's good in our heart so it can come out of our lives. So we have this encounter with God. It's great. It's awesome. We're reading our Bible. We're praying. We're coming to youth group. We're coming to church. We're filling our hearts with something good. So we have the good in us, right? Say, we have the good in us. Come on, say it like you mean, like we have good in us. Okay, so you have the good in you at this point. You have the good of who God is, of who Jesus is in this. But then the verse goes on to say, so you keep it in your heart, and then you guard your heart. Very interesting. This is what the Bible, or this is what, this is what it says. When you guard something, I want you to think about this. Think about this concept. You, the, the dictionary says to keep it safe from harm or danger, to protect, to watch over, to keep under close watch. The word for guard means to protect and prevent. It's like a watchman or a guard or on a tower or a soldier on duty. Their job is to keep a lookout for anything that poses a threat to what they protect. Like being a bodyguard on constant alert. Like, when you have a bodyguard, that's when you've made it. Like, when you're able to hire a bodyguard and someone to protect you, that's when you made it. That's when, like, because you don't meet, like, any other, who's this? Oh, this is my bodyguard. And you're like, okay, you must make, you made it. Because you have a bodyguard, because that bodyguard's whole job is to protect your life with their life. I want you to understand that's what a bodyguard does. A bodyguard saying, I'm willing to lay my life down for you, and I'm going to defend and protect you because your life is worth something. So get that mindset in you. That there is this thing that is called guarding, that is protecting. And think about this. Think about the different types of guards that we know. Because there's really two different types of guards that we have. There's like the offense and the defense. All right, let's talk about palace guards. If you haven't you seen Aladdin. All right, so you've seen Aladdin. Or you've seen any movie like that, like fairy tale movie where there's a king and queen and all that stuff. Or maybe think of like Buckingham Palace over in England or even the White House with the Secret Service. They guard so that unwanted people can't get in. All right? So God is saying, listen, I need you to guard your heart, number one, from unwanted things and unwanted evil and unwanted mindsets that could get into your heart and unwanted conditions that could get in you. Listen, I, God says, listen, I want you to protect yourself from greed. Don't let greed get in because it's not welcome here. Don't let anger get into you. Don't allow unforgiveness to get into you. Don't allow hatred to get into your heart. Don't allow depression to get into your heart. Don't allow that anxiety to get into your heart. Protect it, meaning set up those, those guards, those secret service, those ones that stand there and say, listen, you're not allowed in. Guys, listen, if your generation could catch this, I guarantee that you would change everything about the way your culture is, about the health conditions, about the way that you think, the way that you feel. If you can learn to guard your heart and not let just anything in and say, no, no, I'm gonna watch what I put into my heart. I'm gonna watch what I associate with. I'm gonna guard it with everything that I have. When you learn to guard your heart and say, I'm not letting these things in, that's one guard. But then you have to think about this. Then there is what is called the prison guard. They guard so that people can't get out. 
They actually are keeping things in so that they don't get out. And see, what we need to do is we need to set up a guard to keep things out, but we also need to set up a guard to keep things in so they don't go after the wrong things. So, you know, what are some things that we might run after? Well, we might run after the wrong things, like I need this relationship, or I need to date that person, or I need to do this, or I need to accomplish that in order to be loved, or I need to have this, this job in order for people to accept me, or I need to do this action in order for order for kids at school to think I'm cool, or I need to do this, or I need to do that. And no, 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 the, the Bible says that we need to guard our heart from our, our heart going after the wrong things, desiring to go after these things that we shouldn't go after. Saying, that, oh, if I can just have someone love me, then, then I will be okay. If I can just be in this relationship and feel like I matter, and I can keep it there. And so we have to understand that we need to guard our hearts. Think that, oh, if I just, maybe if I just listen to this music all the time, maybe if I just watch this, maybe if I just play this, maybe if I just do all these things, I will, I will allow my heart to be satisfied. And we have to guard our heart from going after the wrong thing and getting out after the wrong thing. So what is it that we're really doing when we're guarding our heart? See, when you guard your heart, you also, you're also guarding your words and you're guarding your thoughts. Because the Bible says, and we'll talk about this next week, how what is ever inside of you is gonna come out of you. Whatever is in your heart comes out your mouth. But we need to protect what values most. And I love that, that we need to protect what, value, what, we've, what is valued the most. Think about the most valuable object that you have, whatever it might be. It's something valuable that you own, something valuable that you have. You don't let anyone just pick it up and hold it. You don't let anyone just borrow it. You just don't set it out in the street and say, hey, anyone come get it that wants it? No, you protect what is so valuable. We guard our money. We guard our loved ones. <laughs> we guard our food. We guard our friends. We guard our family. We protect all of these things that matter so much to us because it has a deep meaning. And see, what God is trying to say is God tells us to guard our hearts because our hearts are the most valuable thing to him. Let me say that again. See, God tells us to guard our hearts because our hearts are the most valuable thing to him. The condition of your heart is the most valuable thing that God has. I want you to think about that. So meaning your life is the most important thing that God owns. The condition of your heart, being connected to him, that is so valuable to him. So if tonight you're here and you're saying, listen, like I have this heart and it's not where it needs to be and it needs a change. God is saying, yes, you need to give that heart to me. You need to sell that heart over to me. You need to recommit that heart to me. You need to give that heart so that you can have it and fill it with the right stuff. But then you need to guard it once you have it. Come on, Jeffrey. Once you have it, you need to protect that. See, what's cool about David, we talk about David all the time. Remember, David is one that killed the giant Goliath. And we talked about how you need to run at your giants and how David was so important. But then David became the king of Israel. But you know what's crazy about David is, you know, when David was a teenager, he was actually forgotten. That, that people didn't, David's dad didn't even remember him. David's dad completely even forgot that David was around or existed. Because see, the prophet came to Jesse. He said, Jesse, I want, I want you to know that in your sons, you have all these sons, one of them's gonna be king, so bring them out and I'll figure it out. So Jesse, the prophet, goes down all of the kings or all the sons looking for the king of Israel. Who will be the next king to take Saul's place? And he's looking at all these guys. He's like, oh man, this guy is built. He's jacked, he's got muscles. This has gotta be the next king. And God says, no. The next brother comes up. Well, this guy's really smart. He's really intelligent. He knows all of a sudden, this must be the next king. No. Oh, well, this guy, he's really athletic. He's got it going on. He's, he's got this. He's got that. This must be the next king. God says, no, Jesse. And so finally, Jesse goes through all the brothers. He gets the last one. He goes, finally, this must be the king. This must be it. This guy looks it. He's handsome. He's tall. He's strong. He's smart. This guy is the full package. So this guy must be king. And God said, no. God said, no. He said, this is not. These are not it. So then Jesse, uh, or the prophet asked Jesse, do you have any more sons around? And then it dawned on him, oh, duh. I have my youngest son, David, but he's just, he's some shepherd that hangs out in the fields all day. 
He just hangs out there all day. And all he does is he actually just protects our stupid sheep. He guards our sheep night and day. He fights them off from wild animals like lions and bears and all this stuff. Like, that can't be him. And Jesse said, go get him. And soon as David showed up, David, I can only imagine David rolling up like a dirt ball, dirt everywhere, probably smells. He's been out with sheep all the time. He might look real rough looking. The Bible says that he had rugged red hair. And he probably just was like some dude who was like, hey, what's up? What's going on? And God said, that is the next king. Because it's very interesting, the passage of scripture says that God does not look on the outward appearance of man, but he looks at the heart. And it just made me think, could it be that David was able to be qualified as king because he knew how to guard things like sheep? He knew how to protect something. So when he's out in the field singing songs to God, just getting close to God, getting his heart right with God, just loving God, protecting what he's over and not even thinking more, is that what qualified him? Could it be that sometimes your heart can be, where your heart is, the condition of it, can be the placement of where God wants to take you? Students, listen to me. Where your heart is right now, it could be the very thing that God says, that's what I'm gonna use to change the school. That's what I'm going to use to change the high school. That's what I'm going to use to change the middle school. What Their heart is good, and that's what I'm looking at. So I want them to be the one to change it. See, we must guard our hearts because it controls this. It's the control center of our whole entire life. And it's the most valuable thing to God. So kicking off this year, I want to ask you, me to you, everybody looking at me, me looking at everyone, I want to ask you directly to your face, do you need to change your heart? Do you need to change your heart? Even just, we were just, we've been gone a month. Even within that month, has your heart gone somewhere that was passionately loving Jesus and going after him to a heart now that's been like, eh, I don't really care. I haven't really talked to God in a couple weeks, maybe since camp, maybe since the last time we had a service. Do you need to change your heart tonight? Second question is this, for some of you, do you need just to give your heart to Jesus? Maybe you never have. Maybe you've never said, God, just take my heart. Accept my heart. So tonight, there are two types of people, those that want to rededicate and say, God, I want to to start tonight. On this night, I want to kick off this year, starting with refuge tonight. And from this point forward, I'm going to change my heart. Maybe that's you tonight. Number two, maybe you're here tonight and you've never decided to really give your heart to God. Maybe you've never really said, I'm all in on this. I'm really going to do this. Well, tonight, it's a night to change your heart and to get it right, get it exactly where it needs to be. Because listen, if you know me, if you've been around us long enough, if you know the leaders, if you know this program, if you've grown up in church, if you were in, just in children's church and now you're in youth group, you know the truth. So what has been put out to you, you gotta protect that. God's saying, listen, You've been hearing about Jesus for for a couple of months now, a couple of years now. You need to protect what's in your heart and start living the right way. So with all heads bowed and eyes closed, nobody looking around, this is how we're going to start this year. Nobody looking around, no one talking, put your phones away. We're not here for that. See, the reason why we ask you to bow your head and to close your eyes and to not focus on anything else is so that you have a moment to evaluate your heart. You have that moment to evaluate what is going on deep inside of you. So with nobody looking around, no one evaluating, I wanna read this verse one more time to you so that you understand it. It says, pay attention to what you have learned. Turn your ear to the words that you've heard. Maybe your youth pastor or senior pastor or mom or dad or grandmother say. Don't let what you know about Jesus out of your sight. But keep it in your heart. For they are life. And to those that find them, meaning that that this relationship with Jesus is going to bring you life. It's going to bring you health. It's going to help your body. But above all else, guard what you already know about Jesus. Guard what you already know about your heart. Guard the things that you've been taught. That's what this verse is saying, guys. 
So tonight across this room, I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna ask for boldness this year. I'm gonna ask for those who do things that they may feel uncomfortable with. I'm gonna ask you to take steps that you never thought. This year you're gonna be challenged like you've never been challenged before to do the right thing. So tonight, if you are that first group that says, you know what? PM, I need a heart change because I, I said that I did it. I said that I loved him, but tonight I need to rededicate it. And that's cool because sometimes along the lines when we're walking this out with God, sometimes we need to rededicate these things. Sometimes we need a do-over. To say, man, I messed up. I haven't been doing it. So God, because of your grace, your mercy, your forgiveness, I can redo this. So maybe that's you tonight. Or maybe tonight you've never, ever ask Jesus to legitimately come into your heart. And tonight's the night of change. So I'm going to ask you one more time. Do you need to change your heart? If tonight you're in this room in the privacy of everyone that is here, if you need to change your heart tonight, I'm just going to ask you to stand to your feet where you're at. If you need to change your heart tonight, I'm just gonna ask you to stand, that's it. I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand, I'm not gonna ask you to come front forward, I'm just gonna ask you to stand. I'm gonna give a couple more seconds, thank you for standing, those that have stood, I appreciate it. Give you a few more moments, but if tonight you need to change what is in your heart, I just encourage you to stand. Don't, don't, you don't have to be nervous. You don't have to be nervous. So with all heads bowed and eyes closed, we're just gonna say this. Those that are standing, you can repeat after me. Those that are in their seats, you can repeat after me too if you want to, if you didn't wanna stand, it's cool. But just in the privacy of your heart, say, dear God, thank you for bringing me here. I need to change my heart. I haven't lived the way that I told you I would. I haven't lived the way that I know I should. So tonight, I ask you to change my heart. Help me guard and protect that which is deep within me. Help me fill my heart with good things. Forgive me of the things that I have done. And let me live for you more than ever before. God, tonight, that is our prayer, that we will fill our lives with good things, that we will live like we never have before, that we will be passionate about you like we've never been before. God, that we will just fall such in love with you that nothing can match that. And so, Jesus, tonight, I thank you for the students that are standing. I thank you that they were courageous. I thank you that they stood for the things that they know they should. And God, I thank you for the students in their seats, that they evaluated. Some of them prayed this. Some of them said, I, I need to get my heart right as well. So, God, I pray that you bless us. God, I pray that this year will be the best year that we ever had. And God, I pray, Lord, that you will allow us to know you in a deeper way and that we can change our heart. And we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. Have a seat for one minute, those that are standing. This is my goal for this year. Ryan and I, we were talking about goals. We are talking about accomplishments. This is what my goal is. My goal is that we take this group that we have here and that we draw closer to God and closer together than ever before. That we learn that we are here for one another and that God is here for us. That's my first goal, is that we grow closer to God and grow closer to each other. Number two is this, is that we have a lot of empty seats still in this place. Just think about, think about this. Just think about if our, if our one goal, just our one goal by, by November, is that we just fill this, these two sections completely. And you know how we could do that? If each one of you just invited one friend, we would fill this, this, this whole, these whole two sections. All you have to do is invite one friend. That's it. And I'm not talking to, to come and get a toilet seat or come and get a crown or come and hang out in the BK lounge and get free Burger King. And I'm not talking about playing goofy games and getting a great prize. But no, I'm talking about that one friend that you know what, you know could fit here. 
Because you know, refuge is for this. This youth group, this youth ministry, refuge is a safe place for you to be at. And some of you know friends at school that need a safe place. So I'm gonna challenge you. I'm gonna challenge you. I want you to ask one friend to come with you next week and be annoying about it. Because I know you can be, all right? Be annoying about it. Say, listen, you need to come to church. You need to come hang out with us. You need to come and hang out at Refuge. You need to, to be here. You need to find us. So all you have to do is think of that one friend. Just think of that one friend that you can invite. It doesn't matter if they're younger or if they're older, but invite that one friend that is a teenager. Say, you know what? They need to be here. They need to come and hang out. I want to encourage you. You know what? I'm gonna be as bold to say this. You bring a friend next week. We just, we got, how many? We got like, 500 pairs of sunglasses, right? You come next week, I'll give you and your friend three pairs of sunglasses. You don't even have to buy them. Carly tried to sell them tonight and they just wouldn't sell. Sometimes they sell, the market's, you know, kind of up and down right now, the whole Nike thing's going on, so we're kind of like, you know. But anyhow, you, if you bring a friend next week and they come, I'll give you and your friend a free pair of sunglasses. I, I, I will deal you with that. Someone that has never been here before, someone that may have used to came all the time and they don't come, deal. But we will do that. If we gotta order more sunglasses, we will. And if that is not enough initiative, bring them here because they need Jesus. Guys, I'm passionate about this year. This year is gonna be the best year that we've had. It really is, but we can only grow if you initiate it. I am gonna be at Altoona High School this year, just to let you know. I will be there in, for the 10th, 11th, and 12th graders because I'm gonna be in charge of what is called Fellowship of Christian Athletes. So I'll be at your school this year. I will be at your school twice a month. You'll see me hanging out. Ryan and I both, we'll be there. Bringing breakfast, hanging out. Talking about the athletes, bringing, talking to them about Jesus, being able to start this, this Christian club. So we will be there. So guess what? I'm gonna, we're gonna encounter all of your friends that you could invite here. So I wanna challenge you next week, just one friend. You bring one friend, you both get sunglasses. But don't tell them like, oh, hey, he's gonna give you sunglasses. Don't tell them that. Just let him show up and get some sunglasses. You bring two friends, I'll give you, I'll give, I don't care how many friends you bring. If you bring 30 friends, we will order more sunglasses and get all of you sunglasses. Listen, you will bring 100. Yeah, you get, yeah, you get, hey, you know what? You bring 30 friends. If one of you brings 30, we'll give you all the swag we got. Sunglasses, mugs, t-shirts. We'll do all that. All that. You bring five, you bring five friends, I'll give you a t-shirt. You bring five, I'm serious. Whatever I gotta do to light a fire under your butt to get friends here. Because your school needs Jesus, right? Right. God, thank you for tonight. Thank you for this crazy crew. Thank you for these crazy leaders. Thank you for allowing us to love you. I pray tonight as we go, God, that you bless us, you be with us, you make our heart new. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.